Hi everyone, my name is Carl. We're so glad to have you at church today. I just wanna take a few moments and share a couple things coming up for you and your family. We know life can be busy and things out of our control can get scheduled on Sunday. That is why we are excited to be offering a Saturday night service again. The service on Saturday is identical to our Sunday service. The worship and the message are all the same. We even have our underground middle school service on Saturday, so you're not missing out on anything except for maybe a donut. The Saturday night service starts at 5 p.m. Satellite parking is available on Sundays at Ronald Reagan Middle School. Reagan is just down Waverly Farm Drive. Look for the sign to turn at Tanning House Place. The shuttle makes its way around every 15 minutes, starting at 6.15 a.m. Also, if you happen to have a CDL license with a passenger endorsement and would like to consider helping out with the shuttle bus, then email Ted Saunders at ted at parkvalleychurch.com. We will be having our job fair May 5th from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. There is still more room for businesses to be represented. If you're a business owner and would like to participate in the job fair, then please visit our events page on our website to reserve a space. As always, you can find out more information about anything going on at Park Valley at the info bar in the lobby or on our website. Thank you for being here with us today. We hope you have a great week. Um, we're going to be looking today at, um, you know, we've got a couple more weekends of uh, restoring relationships. And today we're going to be talking a little bit about emotions and, and hopefully it's something that will be a blessing to you. You know, I'm, I'm convinced that communication is literally um, probably, it's vital to every relationship. It's probably one of the most important things you'll do in any relationship uh, communication is huge. It's vital. And, you know, the truth of the matter is without communication, you just can't make any progress. And that's why it's always weird to me when a couple comes up to me and says, hey, we've decided to work on our marriage apart from each other. And I always go, that doesn't make any sense. You know, sometimes I say that, not all the time. Um, but I do think it, you know, from time to time because you can't communicate with each other if you're apart. It's hard to work on something apart. And I know there, there are instances where there are, there's danger. You know, if there's danger in a relationship, then I, I got that. But I think a lot of times that's just code for, I'm kind of tired of communicating. You know, I'm kind of tired of the issue. I'm kind of tired of uh, constantly dealing with the conflict and with the arguing and with whatever. And kind of what we learned about last week was just the fact that uh, just because something is difficult doesn't mean, it, you know, we should quit it just because it's tough. And so, um, as a matter of fact, I think a lot of times it's those difficult relationships that we go through that God uses to kind of grow us the most. And so, we kind of hang in there and let God do His thing uh, and, and kind of grow us up. We learn that God is so much more interested in our character than He is our comfort. And so, we hang in there. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, it's just really hard to make progress without any kind of uh, communication. And if you're separate, it's just hard to do. So in the first 11 chapters of Genesis, God talks about some things that are pretty huge. He talks about four major things. And um, a lot of people say that if you can believe the first 11 chapters of Genesis, and you're not going to have any problem with anything in the Bible, uh, because there are four blockbuster events take place in the first 11 chapters. Uh, the first thing is a thing called creation. We all know about that, right? <laughs> Um, when God basically spoke everything into existence in six days, which let me be the first to say that I believe that, you know, 100% that God did that. And there's, you know, a lot of other people that maybe believe other things, but um, I honestly believe that it takes a whole lot more faith to believe that everything happened out of nothing than it does to believe that God spoke it all into existence. And just the fact that God exists and just the fact that God is a creator and just the fact that God has all this power, and just the, the fact that God, you know, is in control of things, kind of, in a sense, really kind of gives me purpose and meaning to my life, no matter what happens, to know somebody's in control. Uh, it helps me kind of connect the dots. And it's not just about me helping me connect dots. You know, it's about the fact that, you know, God definitely gives perspective and purpose to everything that he made and created. Uh, so it makes a lot of sense. The second thing that happened is uh, the fall of man. So God created, the, the, literally the highlight of God's creation was Adam, made him in his image, and yet the highlight of God's creation decided to turn his back on the creator. You know, go figure. And I guarantee you I would have done the same thing, probably a whole lot sooner than he did. Um, but he decided to do that, and as a result of that, you know, man fell. 
And things after that didn't get a whole lot better because the third major event was God decided to destroy the entire human race. And we know that's called uh, the flood. There was only one family that made it through. And that guy's name was Noah, right? And so there's this verse in the Bible in the Old Testament that is so cool. It basically says that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Kind of a sweet little nugget right there in the middle of a whole lot of yuck. You know, you've got this grace from a God, you know, who shows it to Noah. And um, so Noah and his family made it. They got on this ark that they built. And sometimes people have a hard time believing that. But there's really nothing crazy about a global flood scenario or story because, I don't know if you knew this or not, every major civilization that's ever exist, existed has a flood, global flood narrative and story. So it's not weird that we're talking about it because everybody else has been talking about it ever since it happened. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a real thing. And then after that, uh, there's this thing called the Tower of Babel, right? As you get towards chapter 11, Basically, the Tower of Babel is this big, huge, mega, epic struggle between the will of man and the will of God. And by the way, I don't recommend you get into that struggle with God because he tends to win those struggles because <laughs> uh, he's God and we're not. Um, but anyway, you know, there's this epic struggle that takes place and, you know, God wants mankind to disperse all throughout the earth and repopulate the earth. And mankind says, I think we're going to hang out, stay close, you know. Instead, uh, God was like, okay, that's not good. Uh, then God wanted to be worshipped exclusively, and mankind decided, you know, I think we're going to worship other, other things and other, other gods. So that's not good. And God said, I want you guys to remain humble. And they decided to build this big, huge mega tower called the Tower of Babel uh, to make a name for themselves. That's literally what the Bible says. They decided in pride to do this. And God said, okay, enough's enough. And he put a stop to everything, right? Now, let me ask you this. If two people together are accomplishing a whole lot, what's the best way that you can stop their progress? Well, take away their ability to communicate, and you stop their progress dead cold right there. Look at what the Bible says. Genesis chapter 11 and verse 6. Look, he said, the people are united, and they all speak the same language. After this, nothing they set out to do will be impossible for them. That's God's way of saying, do you know how powerful communication is? I mean, it brings so much unity. When you have amazing communication with somebody, it brings unity. And quite frankly, the sky's the limit. You can do it anything if, you're, if you have good communication with someone. And so the next time you're having a fight with your husband or wife, just sit back and say, hey, you know, this ain't so bad because the sky's the limit. We're arguing right now, but we're talking. That's good. Communication's good. Unity's going to come out of this somehow, some way. God says in the Word that there's incredible upside potential for unity, and the sky's the limit on anything that we can accomplish together in our relationship because of our communication. And so that's just straight from God. Verse number seven says he's going to change it all. Come, let's go down. Let's confuse the people with different languages so that they won't be able to understand each other. And verse 8, in that way the Lord scattered them all over the world, God won, right, and stopped them from building the city. So progress stopped when they couldn't communicate. Now, communication is huge. One of the greatest and most powerful ways that you can communicate with somebody is with your emotions. Your emotions are very, very, very powerful. They are. And, you know, you may sit back and ask the question, why did God make me so emotional? Easy answer, because he wants you to be effective in your communication. Not just with other people, but sometimes even with yourself. Your emotions speak loud and clear to yourself. They also speak loud and clear to people around you. And, I mean, think about how powerful emotions are. You, as a husband, can speak to your wife. You can make your case for 30 minutes, and at the end of your case, roll your eyes and ruin everything that you just said. <laughs> from one rolling of the eyes. There's that little stream that connects from your eyes all the way to your heart and reveals a purpose or a motive or you know, what you're really thinking or an emotion. And it's like, okay, that's terrible. I don't believe you. You rolled your eyes, you know? And then you spend another 30 minutes trying to convince her you didn't roll your eyes. 
So I'm just saying, emotions are really, really powerful. It's the same thing when it comes to crying. Maybe you have an argument with your wife, and all of a sudden your wife starts to cry. Guess what? She wins. <laughs> Automatic. It's the nuclear option. If, if there is tears, it's game over, right? Why? Well, because it's a very, very powerful thing. Emotions are very, very powerful. You may be at a restaurant, sitting at your table, having dinner, and in four tables over, there's somebody laughing, and I mean, it's a belly laugh. They're just laughing, and then you're going, oh, that guy, and you're like, listen to that guy, <laughs> and then all of a sudden, you start laughing, and then everybody in your table starts, it's contagious. Laughter can be contagious. Laughter can spread joy. It's crazy how it works. Why? Because emotions are very, very powerful. It's the same thing with anger. You can walk into a room where everybody's fine, and you start flipping things around and throwing things down, and finally, somebody who was completely fine, having a great day, looks at you and says, hey, knock it off. Then it's back and forth. Then it's like somebody else gets into it. Then, like, everybody's fighting. Why? Because this anger is contagious. I told you the story about the time that, you know, I'm driving down the road, and I've told you a thousand times, I apologize, but I always say, cut me slack, I've been here 15 years. But, so, driving down the road, I'm irritated, and I'm probably, I got the kids in the car, and I'm going, yeah, 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 you know, <laughs> getting into it like other people do around here, I don't know. And finally, I get to a place where I stop the car abruptly, and my toddler, Andrew, in the back in a car seat, as soon as I start the car, goes, come on, lady. (laughs) And I'm like, okay, where did that come from? And I'm like, I know exactly where it came from. It came from me. He was learning from me. And a lot of times, frustration and anger and irritation and all those things are, you know, contagious. And they start to spill over. Why? Because Our emotions communicate in a very powerful way, and they just spread. They spread all over, and we have to to realize that. Now, we're emotional because God made us that way. God is emotional. You can learn so much about God as you read through the Bible, just in 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 the, um, the way the Bible describes the emotions of God. I mean, the Bible says that God gets angry, and the Bible says that God laughs. I like that there are verses in Psalms that says God laughs at the ungodly. I think, whoa, that's like awesome. You know, he's like laughing at the ungodly. I mean, the Bible talks about the fact that he has compassion. The Bible talks about the fact that, you know, God can literally be grieved. You know, the Bible talks about the fact that not, not just that God loves, but that God is love. He is love. The Bible talks about the fact that, you know, God can hate. There's literally a verse in the Bible that says, these six things doth the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination. So there are things that God hates. There's this thing, the Bible literally says that God is a jealous God. Sometimes we think we can get away with it. We can do whatever we want. I can have anything I want at the center of my life. And yes, you can but God ain't going to let it go on too long because he's a jealous God. God wants to be at the center of your life. God wants to be number one. God doesn't want you worshiping anybody or anything else other than him. He's a jealous God. The Bible said God is a joyous God. And so all of these things that God has in his life, literally he has given us because he's made us like himself. And so the next time somebody comes up to you and says, you know what, I got a problem with your emotions, just say, oh no, you don't have a problem with me. You got a problem with God. Because that's the way God made me. And, you know, God's emotional. And I'm emotional as a result of it. I like Psalm 139 and verse 13. It says, you made all the delicate inner parts of my body. You knit me together in my mother's womb. When I think about those delicate inner parts, I think about things like my mind and my emotions and my personality and all of these things that God is weaving together to make me. It's crazy, but it's true. It's, a, it's exactly what, he's did, what, he, what he did for us. Now, here's the thing. Emotions are amazing, and all of them, in some way, shape, or form, are positive. Every single one of them. They're God-given. The key to having, you know, 
healthy emotions is, is balance. That's the key. You know, Rick Warren always talks about the fact how balance and health really go hand in hand. And he talks about, it, about you know, balance in the body. He says, you know, as long as we have chemical balance in our body, and as long as the systems in our body are all in balance, what happens is, is that the body is at ease. But when things get out of balance, a system or a chemical or whatever it may be, it gets completely out of sync. There's no equilibrium. There's no stasis. There's this complete imbalance. What happens is that, that the body is at disease, disease, or literally a disease takes over in the body. Every disease we have in our bodies is just an imbalance of some sort. That's all it is. And it's the same thing when it comes to your emotions. If, you're ba- if, you're, if your emotions are balanced, then you'll be healthy emotionally. It's just, you know, just the way it is. And sometimes we look at emotions like anger and fear and sorrow and frustration and pride, and we say, these are bad. You can't have them in your life. No, you know what? God gave them for a very important reason, for you to have them in your life. I mean, you know, you think about anger. Anger can be a very positive thing. You communicate to somebody, and you have some anger in your, in your voice or whatever it may be, and you basically just communicated to your child, you know what? You cross a line. And your child's thinking, uh-oh, I did something wrong, right? I crossed the line. And sometimes our kids need to know when they cross the line, right? It's the same thing when it comes to maybe somebody at work, and maybe there's some anger in your communication, and you just communicated to them, you know what, I'm not okay with what, what, with what happened here. I'm not okay with what this company is doing. I'm not okay with these decisions. I'm not okay with it. Maybe in a, when you're talking to a spouse, you're, you're, you're talking in a way that says, you know what, this is very important to me, what I'm saying right now. Very important. Or maybe it's anger that causes somebody to stand up against some kind of an injustice. You see an injustice, and it ticks you off. And so you stand up and you say, I'm going to do something about this. Most of the time, you know, I, 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 I think about this lady by the name of Candace Leitner. You know, everybody in here knows her, but we don't know her. Her daughter was 13 years old and killed by a drunk driver, and she got ticked off about it. And so she started an organization called Mothers Against Drunk Driving. And now they have offices in every single state in America. They have offices in every province in Canada. And she's making a difference. You know why? Because she got mad. And now she's doing something about it. So there's a lot of positives when it comes to that. However, how many of you believe anger can cross the line? Absolutely. Absolutely. Somebody's going, you better raise your hand. Because you done crossed the line even this morning. (laughs) Anger can go too far. Anger can be imbalanced. Listen, if all you have is anger in a relationship, then you have a relationship that's sick, that's diseased, that's not healthy. Because that's an imbalance. And it's too much. Right? And so... You know, there's, there's got to be balance. You say, well, how do you know when it goes too far? Well, look what, look what the Bible says, Ephesians 4, 26. Don't sin by letting anger gain control of you. What the Bible is saying there is this. It is a foregone conclusion that everybody in this room at some point is going to get angry. We're all going to get angry. It's just the way it is. It's an emotion that God gave us. It goes too far when it takes over. It goes too far when it takes control. It goes too far when you make this statement. I never thought I would have said that. I never thought I would have done that. In a million years, I never in a million years thought I would have ever done that. What you're basically saying is this. Anger took over, and I wasn't in control anymore. Anytime you do something or say something that you wouldn't typically do or say, anger is in control, and you know what God says? When that happens, it's sin. It's not balanced. And it brings disease and sickness to a relationship. Anger is normal, absolutely. But make sure that it's balanced. Make sure that there's a healthy balance when it comes to that. You say, so how do I do that? Well, look at the next phrase in the verse. It says, don't let the sun go down while you're still angry. In other words, deal with it on a daily basis. 
deal with it on a regular basis, that's an important way to be able to, you know, not let anger build day after day, week after week, month after month in your life. So what does God tell us? Number one, peace balances out anger. Isn't it interesting how God gives us that uh, emotion of anger, but he also gives us an opportunity at, at contentment and quietness and peacefulness, something that can literally balance out the anger that comes into our lives. I always say, God didn't just put us on the earth and say, good luck, hope you make it to heaven. He put us on the earth and he gave us a guidebook called the Bible that teaches us literally step by step how to act. He gives us a process, a literally a step-by-step -step process that says, you want to go from anger to peace? Here's how you do it. Step one, step two, step three. Look at Psalm 4, 4. Don't sin by letting anger gain control of you, just like Ephesians. Then it says four things. Number one, think about it overnight. That's smart. Think about it overnight. Maybe you need to sleep on it. Think about it overnight, number one. Number two, remain silent. That's always hard to do, isn't it? I like to talk, especially when I'm in an argument. And I like to win. And I can be a jerk. I'm telling you right now. I don't know how many times in our family, when our kids were growing up, and it was going back and forth and back and forth, and I would look at our, one of our kids and I would say, Stop talking. Don't say another word. Please. I'll tell you what happens. It just escalates and escalates and gets worse and gets worse. And you wonder where it ends. Well, it ends when you say this statement, I never thought I would have said that. I never thought I would have done that before. And so that's why Jesus totally flips the script. And Jesus, in the Sermon on the Mount, he says, hey, somebody slaps you on one side of the face, just turn the other cheek. <coughs> Remember that? It's not easy to do. He says, somebody sues you for your shirt. Hey, after the lawsuit, walk up to him and say, hey, congratulations for getting my shirt. I thought I would throw my coat in on the deal too. <laughs> when the Jews were under Roman domination, they had to carry all of the you know, Roman equipment. And when you were forced to carry a Roman's gear for a mile, at the end of that mile, look up at them and say, I was wondering, do you mind if I carried an extra mile? Just feeling like I would like to do that for you. Somebody somewhere has to de-escalate the situation and not retaliate. Somebody has to do something radical to lower it down, you know, or anger gains control and adds a whole lot of sickness into a relationship. Look at verse 5. After you have thought about it overnight and you haven't said anything about it, you need to offer sacrifices in the right spirit. Anytime you offer a sacrifice that refers to communion, what does that mean? Talk to God about it. Talk to God about it. God, this is what I'm going through. What do you want me to do? I'm really ticked off. You know, what should I do? And God starts to lead you to that process of letting it go and forgiving and, and realizing that everybody makes mistakes and all of a sudden talks you off the ledge. And then what do you do? Number four, trust him. Trust that what he says is going to add health and strength and vibrancy to your relationship. Isn't it interesting in Isaiah 26, 3? Look at this process. You will keep in perfect peace all who trust in you, all whose thoughts are fixed on you. There is a step-by-step -step process where the God of the universe who made you and gave you all of your emotions says, you take this step-by-step -step process and I will take you from anger to peace. And you will have health in your relationship. But you got to submit to me. And you got to believe that this is going to help you Peace balances out anger, and it literally is from God. What about fear? Sometimes we think about fear, right? And, you know, we think of it in a negative way. But I can tell you this, fear can save your life. Fear can save your life. But fear can also cross a line and cause you to be completely wigged out in anxiety and stress and, and, and all of those different things. And I always, I always say I talk, I talk as an expert on fear, not because I've d done you know, a thesis or any kind of paper on fear or whatever. I just live it every day. I'm afraid of everything. And so I know an awful lot about fear. 
Here's what I know. God gave us this thing called thankfulness to balance fear out. And here's why we need it. When you're afraid, it takes an intense focus for you to put your attention on that fear. And when you have such an intense focus on an anxiety or a stress or a fear or whatever it is that you're afraid of, you all of a sudden take your focus and attention off of everything else around you, all of the blessings around you, all of the favor around you, all of the things that God has blessed you with that are literally all around you. You can't even see them anymore because you're focused on something, and many times something that hasn't even happened yet, something that you think may happen in your future, and you're surrounded by a family that loves you. You're surrounded by a beautiful home that God has given you. You're surrounded by a job and provision and friends and health, and you're scared to death because it's an intense focus. It takes your focus off of everything that God has blessed you with. I had a lady that came to me at the church, and she said, I want to talk to you. She said, I am literally consumed by fear. And I said, all right, let's dive into that a little bit. What, what do you think you're afraid of? Everything in her life was perfect. Perfect. Matter of fact, I want you to hear her story. Listen to this. So we've been coming to PBC since 2014. We drove by and saw the church. We had not belonged to a church as a couple. And we were looking for something. We were looking for something. And we knew there was something that we were missing in our lives. And that was uh, God. And we stopped in and we, we came home. We got baptized six months later and have been attending since. So having so many blessings in my life, an amazing husband, my kids, uh, a thriving business, just a phenomenal life. And all my, my prayers answer, I felt that there was a limit to that, that I couldn't be, I couldn't be so happy, that something had to show up that was wrong. And I just kept looking for that. I kept looking for that, that made me extremely anxious. And fear, fear that came from nowhere. Fears that manifested in my body with uh, tension in my shoulder, a constant headache. My stomach in knots for days on end. Until one day I came to church in the middle of the day, um, unexpected, and I asked to see Pastor Barry. And I, I spoke with him and I, in tears, because I couldn't explain what was happening to me. And we prayed and he reminded me of God's promises. And we spoke about Jeremiah 29, 11, the plans that God has for us to keep us safe and to prosper us and, us, and not to harm us. And that was a turning point for me. After that, I, I lived here with a lot of peace in my heart, knowing that I had to trust God and His promises, and that I, no matter what I did, I would, I would always have His blessing, and I would always be favored, and that I needed to trust that um, He would always be there for me. That feeling of being broken and not connected uh, is always there when I am not connected, when I forget that God is around me in all that I do. And no matter what, lucky, not lucky, He's always there for me, blessing us, keeping us safe, keeping us protected and um, loving on us. So feeling broken comes from not being connected with God. And uh, when, I, when I think of that, I, and I've been thinking of that every single day since, that fear has just lifted. It's, it's, it has lifted. I remember one night between the time I came to speak with Pastor Barry and, 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 and today, where I was again struggling with anxiety and fear and talking to my husband, Doug, and saying to him, I just don't know what to do with this. I want to get rid of it. How do I, I don't know who is, doing what I'm doing, living the life that I live, and, and not scared, not anxious, not sad. Who should I model after? And he said, Jesus. Jesus is your model. And that, that makes all the difference. So with that in mind, I'm again, I feel unstoppable. I feel cared for, loved by, and protected by our God. I love Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 and 7. It says, don't worry about anything. It said, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank Him for all that He has done. You know, God doesn't just get all up in our face and say, stop worrying. He says, I don't want you to worry. He said, instead, what I want you to do is I just want you to talk to me. 
talk to me about it. Talk to me about what's on your heart. Talk to me about what is heavy on your heart. And, you know, you know, he'll answer our prayers. And it's a powerful thing. And then it says to be thankful. To be thankful for whatever it is that we're going for. God, thank you for the challenge. God, thank you for the difficulty. Thank you for the struggle. Thank you for the blessings. In a sense, I'm, I'm just, I'm okay with whatever the outcome is for whatever it is you bring in my life. God, thank you for the plans that you have for me. And it's like that thankfulness just takes that fear and just begins to melt it away. And I just love the fact that God's word is so incredibly powerful. The last thing I would say as we wrap up is just, you know, that whole feeling of sorrow. You know, nobody likes to feel sorrow, but sorrow is powerful. I mean, huge, mega, mega powerful. I mean, you have sorrow in your life, and other people notice that, and it's a way to communicate with them to basically just say, I'd like a hug right now, <laughs> you know, or I, I need you to kind of come alongside me right now because I am bumming. <laughs> I'm going through some, some difficulties, and it's a great way to communicate with other people when you have sorrow in your life. You know, not to mention the fact that sorrow always, you know, kind of causes you just to, to settle down and slow down. You ever notice when you get bad news about something, nothing else matters. Everything else stops. Maybe you're at work and you, you just, as you're walking out, you're saying, I'm leaving. I just got bad news. I'm out. And everybody's like, okay, no problem, man. If you need something, everything just stops. Maybe you're driving down the road and you pull over to the side of the road. Or you, maybe there's a reason why they say, hey, are you sitting down? Before they, Everything just needs to slow down. Everything just needs to stop. And you just need to focus on whatever it is that you're sorrowful about. And not only that, but probably the most powerful thing about sorrow is, is it causes you to reevaluate your priorities in life. We just had a service for Jeff Redabaugh, and 650 people showed up for his, his service. And, and when the service was over, I got a text from a guy who basically said this to me. He said these words. He said, you know what? I wanted you to, I want you to, I wanted you to know that I left Jeff's service a different man. I came in one way, and I left different. And then he said this. He said, I'm going to use the rest of my life to do good. That's what he said. You know why? Because sorrow causes you to confront your values. Sorrow causes you to confront your priorities in your life. Am I living the way I should live? Do I have the right values, and do I have the right priorities in my life? So it's a powerful thing. It communicates to you personally. So God gives us this opportunity to balance out sorrow because sorrow can cross the line. Sorrow can enter into discouragement and depression and in a lot of unhealthy things that people go through on a regular basis. And you know what God says? Hey, you know what? I'm the hope giver. God says, I'm going to balance out your sorrow with hope. I'm going to give you something to hope for. I'm going to give you something to hold on to something that's real, something that's tangible. And, you know, there's that old cliche that says you can live 30 days without food and three days without water and three minutes without air, but you can't live three seconds without hope. Everybody needs hope. Can I just say God's a hope giver? You know, when God gets involved, all bets are off. When things seem like there is no hope, there is no answer, God comes in with an answer. God comes in with hope. God comes in with a solution. He's just that way. He's God. And I just say, trust him to balance out the sorrow in your life. You say, what does that mean? I'll tell you what it means. If, if you have a loved one that's gone, and they're safe in Jesus, and they know Jesus, and they were a follower of Jesus, you have hope beyond hope where he is or where she is. You know they're with Jesus. You know they're with the Lord. That's hope. That's why you know, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 says we have a sorrow, but it's, not a, but it's a sorrow that's not without hope because we know where our loved ones are. It's huge. It's amazing. Maybe you're in the middle of a trial. You know what? And God says, you know, not only am I going to, you know, maybe deliver you from this trial, but if I don't deliver you from it, I'm going to walk with it through, you know, through it with you. And so there's hope in that. You know, to know that if, if I have an illness or I have some kind of a physical problem in my life, I have no other choice but to be healed. God's either going to heal me temporarily or heal me eternally. 
but I know he's got his hand on me, and I know he's directing me, and I know there's purpose to everything that I'm going through in my life. I have hope in him. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes for just a minute? I'm going to ask you two simple questions. First question is this. Do you know for sure where you will spend eternity if you were to die, if you were to pass away? And you're like, whoa, wow, pump the brakes. That's like an in-my-face question. You know what? That's an important question for all of us to ask ourselves. Do we know for sure that heaven is our home? Do we know for sure that Jesus is our Lord? Do we know for sure of that? Well, I got one word for you. Gospel. Okay? The word gospel means good news. And if you're here today with a heavy burden of guilt on your back, well, I got good news. And if you're here today with um, an incredible trial that you're in the middle of, I got good news. And if you're here today with a, a heavy burden of sin or whatever it may be in your life, where you feel like you have no hope and no answers, I got good news. The gospel is simple. God became flesh, a human being. His name, Jesus. And rather than conquer one enemy, he conquered the greatest enemy. He conquered sin so that he could literally, from the first century, he, already, he had you in mind already. And you weren't even born. And he died on the cross for you. And then he didn't stay dead. He rose from the dead to put a big fat exclamation point on the fact that he's bigger and stronger and greater than death. And he's bigger and stronger and greater than sin. Why are we letting something like that pull us down? Why are we letting something like that cause us to be hopeless and afraid? He's overcome all of it. He's conquered all of it. And he says, believe in me and trust in me. Let me give you hope. Let me give you life that lasts forever. And I'm not trying to make you anything. We say that at our church all the time. I'm not trying to make you a denomination or trying to make you a member of this church. I'm just trying to introduce you to the only person that can truly give you hope and change your life, and that's Jesus. So if you're here today and you have never, with faith, believed those things, that he died and three days later rose from the dead, I'm going to give you a chance to believe it right now. Right now. Right where you sit. You choose to believe. If you want to believe in him and tell him, why don't you just pray a simple prayer right where you sit. Pray something like this. Dear Heavenly Father, I want you to know that I believe. I believe that you sent your son Jesus, that he died on the cross, and that he rose from the dead for me. I give you my life. All that I am, I give to you. I pray that you would forgive me of my sins. I admit it, I'm a sinner. Please wash me clean. Please forgive me. I take my guilt and I lay it at the foot of the cross. And I want to walk away in freedom and hope. And I believe that you can give that to me. In Jesus' name. With heads bowed and eyes closed, let me ask you this simple question. How many of you would say, Barry, I just now prayed that prayer for the very first time and accepted Jesus Christ into my heart. And you'll raise your hand high and say, that's me. I just prayed it just now and I meant it. Just raise it high and say, that's me. I prayed it and accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. How many of you would say this? Barry, would you pray for me that I would have emotional balance so that it would bring health to my relationships? Would you just raise your hand up? Wow. God, I pray for all of us that you'd bring balance into our life, health into our life, strength into our life, into our relationships. God, every emotion we have is from you. It is a gift from you. I pray, Father, that we would see it that way, but also have balance in all of them. Thank you, Father, for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for watching, and we hope you enjoyed today's message. If God's used this ministry to impact your life in any way, then join us in reaching others by going to parkvalleychurch.com giving where you will find different ways to give. We hope you have a great week.